In today's Lord Gizmo video, we're diving deep into the Earth's crust to uncover treasures untold. Join us as we excavate our top five mining marvels, showcasing the gleaming allure of gold, the timeless strength of granite, the essence of clay, the electrical supreme, copper, and the sculptor's favorite, marble. Marble is typically extracted from open cast quarries, large excavations made into the Earth's surface to access stone formations below. The extraction technique depends on the type of marble and the specific quarry. For instance, Krima Marfil Koto, a popular marble variety, is extracted using vertical cuts, while other types may require horizontal removal based on local geography. A fascinating aspect of marble is its veining or patterns, which provide a unique appearance. These can be streaks of color, swirling shapes, or even golden-like particles. One notable variety is the Sinai Peninsula marble, known for its creamy yellow hue and speckled pattern. It's important to note that marble extraction doesn't always result in perfect, consistently sized blocks. The final block's size and shape can vary depending on the quarry's conditions and extraction methods. However, with careful planning and advanced equipment, these variances can be minimized to ensure optimal marble quality. After extraction, the marble is cut into slabs, a process involving a combination of manual labor and technology. Since each marble block typically weighs between 6 and 15 tons, heavy machinery is used at mining sites. Marble formation is a gradual process, occurring when limestone underground is subjected to high heat and pressure. The large pieces resulting from this process are then cut into slabs using either regular or wet saws, depending on the block's size or composition. A wet saw, for instance, sprays water onto the tile during cutting to keep the material cool and prevent cracking. Wheel loaders, built to handle large loads and operate in tough conditions, are ideal for use in quarries and similar industrial environments. These machines facilitate the rapid and efficient movement of large quantities of material, aiding in marble slab processing along with crawler tractors. Their 35-ton capacity enables them to move the marble blocks to manufacturers for further processing. In tandem with cranes and other specialized machinery, they ensure safe and efficient transportation. At the manufacturing site, blocks are unloaded, sorted, and then sawed into specific sizes and shapes. This phase requires meticulous attention to detail and precise machinery control.
The cutting process involves multi-wire saws, ideal for creating granite and marble slabs due to their ability to quickly slice through stone with a set of diamond wires. For instance, cutting a crema marfil block typically takes around 8 hours, considering its weight and thickness. But the process doesn't end there. The slabs undergo further individual processing. One such process is abrasion, altering the marble's appearance to produce different finishes. Natural marble, formed from metamorphosed limestone or dolostone over millions of years, features distinctive veining, colors, and textures. In contrast, artificial marble, made from synthetic components like small marble pieces, stone powder, quartz, sand, colophony, plastic, cement and acrylic glue mimics natural marble's appearance and characteristics. To strengthen the materials for various uses, a mesh and mega epoxy resins are added, reducing breakage, healing cracks, filling holes and reinforcing the slab's structure, thus enhancing its appearance and smoothness. Later in the process, CNC, computer numerical control, stone cutting is used. This technology allows for intricate patterns to be cut into stone without manual labor. After all cutting steps, workers ensure everything is smooth, proceeding with finishing and minor adjustments. Once satisfied with the appearance, they apply adhesive and join all parts together. Marble's density makes it resistant to heat damage, absorbing energy slowly. This quality makes it an excellent choice for kitchen countertops, fireplace surrounds, and other areas with frequent heat exposure. Its thermal mass also helps regulate indoor temperatures, reducing the need for heating and cooling systems.
Finally, the marble countertops are transported to clients. This delicate stage involves carrying the countertops vertically to maintain their integrity. They are secured to an A-frame on the truck using straps, chains or other fastening mechanisms with stabilizing elements ensuring safe transport. Carrying clamps are used for moving them around, preserving their finish and structural stability. Coins, electric wiring, and bits of cars all have one thing in common. Yes, you've probably guessed it right, they are all made up of copper. It is also dubbed as one of the best conductors of electricity and heat, which is why it is a favorite material in terms of wiring, heat sinks, and cookware. In fact, around 26 million tons of copper are consumed globally each year. But do you have any idea where all of these come from? Looking deeper into this location, you will start to see huge and tall machines getting prepped for their job. This is to prepare the ground for underground mining, Construction of mining site amenities such housing quarters for laborers, offices and warehouses is also included. Copper is found in the earth's crust and the only way to extract it is through mining. The workers are already aware of the dangers and risks of mining, so they make sure to plan the steps they take, especially since it includes explosions and a lot of drilling. Here, you can see holes that are meters long and positioned strategically. These holes will then be filled with explosives to open up the surface of the earth. Now what happens here are all monitored in a control center, usually on top of a tower. Their experts are able to see all of the factors they need to consider when mining like movements, water level, pressure, and so much more. Once all the conditions are done and the area is already blasted off with explosives, the workers start extracting the copper ores. These huge machines you see here are tasked to gather all the debris and materials from the explosion. Since they handle such heavy jobs, these machines are also manufactured to have sturdy, reliable and robust designs. A single mining site requires multiple of these machines in order to have an efficient and smooth workflow. You can also see how machines are not the only thing that keep this mining site together. Since they work with explosives and dig holes, they also need some mechanism that will keep the stability of the ground they work with. This is where special shafts are used. Once they have gathered the debris, they begin to transfer it to another specialized vehicle. Most of the time, these are load haul dump trucks that are specifically made to carry heavy stones and ores. They are filled with broken rocks and ores. Then, after they are filled, they will be driven by the workers so that they can transfer the debris to the processing facility. After extracting the copper ore, it needs to be processed to separate the copper from waste rock and impurities. This can involve crushing, grinding, flotation and electrolysis. The resulting copper is then refined and purified for use in various applications. Fun fact, the Statue of Liberty, a symbol of freedom and democracy, is made of copper and has developed its iconic green patina over the years due to copper's reaction with the environment. Now that they have the ores, the next process is going to be about breaking them down into smaller pieces. This is to ensure that the next processes will be much easier and smoother. Inside a usual processing facility, you can see either a jaw crusher or cone crusher that helps with this whole process. The ore is crushed by two enormous stone jaws in a jaw crusher and the particles are broken up by a rotating cone in a cone crusher. The ore is ground by both devices into pieces no bigger than 10 millimeters in diameter. Ball mills are used to grind the coarse ore into a fine powder after it has been crushed. Steel balls are placed within a revolving drum to form a ball mill. The steel balls strike the ore particles as the drum rotates, fragmenting them into smaller pieces, until the required particle size is reached, which is typically around 100 microns. This process is repeated. The ball mill may also have lifters, classifiers, and diaphragms in order to guarantee uniform grinding. 
These characteristics aid in controlling the material flow within the drum and guard against excessive or insufficient grinding. The waste rock and copper mineral are both present in the resulting slurry and will be separated during the flotation stage. The process of extracting ore does not end there. It still has to be separated from other minerals and impurities. Most of the time, this is done through the process of flotation. But how do they do this? First of all, the ground ore will be mixed with water and chemical collectors. These chemicals are responsible for selectively binding to the copper minerals, while the flocculants are used to remove impurities. After that, this mixture will be transferred to this enormous tank, which is often called the flotation cell. If you look closely, you will see how there are air bubbles forming in the mixture, but do not worry because all of these are part of a plan. These bubbles cause the copper minerals to float, making it easier to separate them. The particles are skimmed off and gathered in a concentrated state as soon as they reach the surface, while the waste rock or sludge descends to the bottom and is removed through the bottom of the cell the froth holding the copper minerals is removed via the top of the cell. There could be as much as 30 to 40% copper in the foam. After that, these separated copper will be transferred to another facility where they can be refined. What this facility does is electrolytic refining. Now that they have the blister copper, they will then slice it into thin plates. These plates will be turned over to this machine that delivers it to this area of the facility. Fun fact, copper is antimicrobial, meaning it has the unique ability to kill or inhibit the growth of bacteria and other microorganisms. This property has made copper incredibly useful in healthcare settings. For example, hospital doorknobs, handrails and even bedrails are sometimes made with copper or copper alloys to reduce the spread of infections. This is where they will start immersing the copper plate into a tank with an electrolyte solution of sulfuric acid and dissolved copper sulfate. When electricity is introduced into the tank, an interesting process begins. Copper ions are released into the solution as the blister copper plates partially disintegrate. Simultaneously, pure copper plates positioned across from the anodes draw in and deposit these copper ions, becoming thicker by the hour. The pure copper that is left on the cathodes after the contaminants in the blister copper dissolve over a few days or sink to the bottom of the tank. These cathode plates are the valuable result of electrolytic purification. They now contain 99.99% .99 pure copper. An interesting and important process for sculpting copper into the exact wires and tubes we come into contact with in daily life is cold drawing. This method turns thick rods or tubes into fine elongated forms by utilizing copper's extraordinary malleability and ductility. With a hole in the middle, somewhat smaller than the diameter of your initial copper rod or tube, picture a robust die made of a donut-shaped piece of hard material such as diamond or tungsten carbide. This die is positioned in the center of the cold drawing setup, prepared to direct the transformation of the metal. With tremendous force, the copper rod or tube is drawn through the die by a strong mechanism. There is a considerable plastic distortion of the metal when it moves through the narrower aperture. Its interior grains align in the direction of the pull, causing it to get compressed and stretched. 
The copper gets longer and thinner with each trip through the die. First diameters can shrink by up to 80%, a substantial fall in size. But the cold drawing method does more for the copper than just make it thinner. It improves its qualities as well. Then it also undergoes wire drawing. Thick copper rods are made into thin, lengthy wires using this method. As the rod is drawn through a sequence of dies with ever tinier holes, the metal is stretched, made longer, and its diameter is decreased. The precise control of the wire's final diameter and cross-sectional shape is largely dependent on each die. This makes it possible to create wires that meet particular mechanical or electrical requirements by using different profiles and thicknesses. Wire drawing not only shapes the copper, but also enhances its strength and conductivity. The pulling process aligns the metal's grains, making it more resistant to breaking and improving its thickness. The whole process will be done by putting all these wires into a big roll. Then, these rolls will be transported and stored inside the facility through the help of this autonomous robot. Even without direct help from human operators, it can do its job pretty well. Fun fact, copper is renowned for its durability and longevity. In many environments, copper can last for hundreds of years. It's not uncommon to find copper artifacts and structures that have remained intact for centuries. The natural patina that forms on copper surfaces over time actually helps protect it from corrosion. So, whether it's copper pipes, roofs, or ancient sculptures, copper's ability to withstand the test of time is one of its remarkable qualities. The copper is placed into this treatment furnace to make sure its quality is not affected. After they have checked and confirmed that it is good to go, they wrap it in this plastic as a preparation for distribution. First step has to do with the mining phase, or extracting the gold. It is not found directly on the Earth's surface in large quantities, so most of the mining processes involve taking a deeper look at the Earth's crust. Gold can be extracted using two different main types of extraction. It can either be through surface mining or underground mining. When resources or minerals are found close to the surface, surface mining is employed. Using explosives and heavy gear to remove waste rock and reveal the gold-bearing ore, this approach entails extracting gold from a big, open pit. When the ore is easily accessible and the gold deposit is near the surface, open pit mining is frequently employed. In comparison to underground mining, this technique can be less expensive and enables for large-scale mining.
If appropriate safeguards are not followed, it can also seriously harm the ecosystem. Conversely, underground mining is usually employed in regions with challenging geology or when the gold resource is situated far below the surface. Compared to open pit mining, this technique can be more costly and calls for specialist equipment. Since the gold is removed from the entire vein rather than just the surface layers, it can also lead to higher gold recoveries. When compared to open pit mining, underground mining can also lower the danger of environmental harm. When resources or minerals are found far below the surface, underground mining is employed. Although this form of mining is more costly and risky than surface mining, it is essential for gaining access to some of the most precious minerals and commodities. Gold extraction from deep underground mines is a multi-step process. Getting the mine door to the surface for additional processing is one of the first and most important steps in the process. Large dump trucks or other heavy machinery made especially for maneuvering the treacherous mine environment are usually needed for this activity. These sturdy vehicles transport the ore holding gold from the mine's depths to the processing plant. This facility's location may change based on distance and logistical considerations. It may be positioned near the mine, but in other situations it may be farther away, necessitating careful preparation for transportation. The world's deepest underground gold mine is South Africa's Mponeng Mine, extending over 4 kilometers, about 2.5 miles, below the Earth's surface. This depth surpasses the height of most mountains. At such depths, temperatures can soar up to 60 degrees Celsius or 140 degrees Fahrenheit, creating a sweltering work environment. To combat this, a unique ice slurry is used to cool the air, turning this subterranean world into a paradox of fiery rock faces and icy breezes. The processing facility puts the gold ore through a number of stages in order to extract the precious metal. The ore is fed into specialized machinery in the first stage of crushing, which reduces it into ever tinier pieces. This procedure, which is essential for separating the gold from the nearby rock and minerals, makes use of enormous crushers that can handle hard, huge materials. Grinding, which follows after crushing, further grinds the ore particles into an even finer powder. Large spinning mills loaded with steel rods or balls for grinding are usually used to accomplish this. After that, the fine powder moves on to the next phase of processing, where it undergoes a chemical treatment meant to dissolve and extract the gold from the leftover undesirable elements. It is not enough that the rocks are just placed inside a grinding machine. There is still a lot of process that goes after that to truly extract the gold. Cyanidation is one of the processes this batch of rocks must go through. It is utilizing a mild cyanide solution, usually sodium cyanide, to dissolve the gold. Gold and cyanide combine to generate a soluble complex that makes it possible to separate the metal from the remaining ore. Its affordability and efficiency make it a popular choice. However, some nations have outlawed its use due to environmental concerns. They will then need to experience heat leaching. Using this technique, crushed ore is stacked on a pad that has been specially made and then sprayed with cyanide solution. After dissolving in the mixture and seeping through the heap, the gold is gathered and processed. When the ore's gold content is too low to make more conventional processes like flotation and milling economically viable, this technique is frequently employed. Refinement is the last stage of the process that the gold particles go through after they are effectively separated from the leftover rock and minerals. The goal of this important step is to further purify the gold by getting rid of any leftover impurities and reaching a higher purity level 
which is frequently greater than 99.5%. The two most used processes for refining gold are smelting and fire assay. Fire assay comes first. The precise measurement of the material's gold content is the main goal of this technique. It entails heating the gold-bearing substance to a high temperature in a furnace. In order to expedite the melting process and isolate the gold from undesirable constituents, fluxes and a reducing agent are added. The gold is carefully separated and weighed to ascertain its exact quantity after it has been completely melted. Smelting places more emphasis on physically removing the gold from any residual impurities than fire assay does. This process melts the gold-bearing material by using intense heat, usually above 1064 degrees Celsius in a furnace. Fluxes are essential in this process because they help generate slag, a waste product that contains the impurities. The slag, which is lighter than the molten metal combination, rises to the surface and is gently skimmed off as the mixture heats. The remaining pure molten gold is then poured into molds to harden into the required shapes such as ingots, which are then ready for trading or further use. The mine's once rough gold is refined into a very valuable commodity through these painstaking steps, making it suitable for a wide range of uses in many sectors and applications. Despite being associated with jewelry and riches, gold is an essential aspect of modern technologies, especially circuitry and electronics. For applications requiring effective current flow, its remarkable conductivity, resistance to corrosion, and ductility make it the perfect choice. Consistent performance and signal integrity are guaranteed by gold's resistance to tarnishing and corrosion, especially in delicate electronic components, because of its ductility and malleability. It can be formed into complex shapes and pulled into thin wires, which makes it ideal for tiny circuits and sensitive electronic components. There is sure an abundance of rocks on Earth, but did you know that not all rocks are made the same? Yes, they are all with different purposes too. Granite is found in the Earth's crust. They are in formations known as plutons, or the magma that has solidified underground. Granite is used mostly for landscaping, and it is usually found on certain places like mountain ranges, plateaus, and plains. Although granite is quite common, the process of acquiring it can be very meticulous and requires high precision. Why? Because it uses these explosives. Just like how other mining companies do it, this facility uses this big machine to drill around 172 boreholes into the area, The boreholes have 93 diameters each, and they are equally spaced in this 200-meter space. Once they are done with boring holes, the workers will start inserting explosives. You can notice that they are tied to a rope, and the purpose of this is to make it easier for them to slowly insert the explosives. Once they make sure that everything is set, the workers move to a safer distance. Then, start the explosion. It may be a big and messy procedure, but it is quick. Do not worry, because all of the debris will be taken care of by these huge machines. Large backhoes are typically used for removing these rocks due to their power and versatility. The process starts with scooping up the debris using the backhoe's large bucket until the truck is filled. Once the truck is full, it will transfer the rocks to either a processing facility or a crusher depending on the site requirements. Here is a fun fact about CAT. It is renowned for its massive and powerful dump trucks, often used in mining and heavy construction. One of the most astonishing models is the CAT 797F which holds the title of one of the largest mechanical dump trucks in the world. This colossal vehicle stands at over 24 feet tall, 
almost as high as a two-story building, and is about 49 feet long. The 797F can carry a staggering 400 tons, which is equivalent to the weight of about 200 average-sized cars. The rocks can be moved to the next facility for additional processing once they have been crushed to the appropriate size. There are two methods to go about this. Some businesses still employ the antiquated technique of using an excavator or front-end loader to gather the crushed rocks and then loading them into trucks. Although it can be labor-intensive and dusty, this is a reasonably easy and affordable way. Some businesses have made investments in more advanced systems that load automatically. Conveyor belts are frequently used in these systems to move broken rocks from the crusher to hoppers or chambers. The rocks are then automatically loaded onto trucks that are waiting. The crushed rocks are finally placed onto trains and driven to their destination, regardless of the technique employed. Depending on how the rocks are going to be used, their sizes will change. Let us go back to the processes at the quarry. Here you can see how these granite slabs are cut and processed even further. These days, wire sawing is the recommended technique. For a more accurate and clean process, they can also use wire sawing. Drilled holes on the granite face are strung with a diamond-coated wire that resembles a huge cheese cutter. As the wire passes through the rock, water continuously cools it, reducing noise and dust. With little waste, this technique yields huge rectangular blocks. Here is a fun fact, a fascinating aspect of granite wire cutting, specifically using diamond wire saws, is how it revolutionizes the way we cut through one of the hardest materials on earth. The diamond wire saw was initially developed in the 1950s for cutting marble, but it was later adapted for granite, which is much harder. The wire can be incredibly long, sometimes over a kilometer in length, and is able to make precise cuts that other saws can't, even in the most delicate or complex shapes. Once they are satisfied with the product, they will start loading these onto these heavy-duty trucks. These vehicles will now be tasked to safely transfer the slabs from the quarry to the processing plant. When the granite slab first arrives at the mill, it must first get prepared by shaping the block and getting rid of unwanted edges. This method starts with the positioning of the granite block, securely fixed to prevent any movement during cutting. The wire saw is essentially a long, flexible cable. The wire is threaded through a series of pulleys and wrapped around the block, and then tensioned. As the saw operates, the wire moves at a high velocity. The next step is to cut them into thin slabs using multi-wire saws. These state-of-the-art machines employ multiple diamond-coated wires to slice through the stone quickly and accurately, producing numerous slabs at once. Companies also opt for a multi-blade saw over a wire saw, as it has several key benefits. Firstly, speed is a significant advantage. Multi-blade saws can simultaneously slice through granite, dramatically reducing the time needed for cutting. The fixed setup of the blades reduces the chances of errors that might occur due to the flexibility of a wire saw, ensuring straighter and more precise cuts. After a multi-blade saw cutter has been used to slice granite into slabs, the next process involves several stages of refinement to prepare the granite for its final use. 
This multi-step procedure is crucial to enhance the natural beauty and characteristics of the granite, ensuring it meets specific aesthetic and functional requirements. The freshly cut slabs are first smoothed to eliminate any sore marks or imperfections. This is typically done using abrasive pads under a machine that grinds the surface until it's uniformly smooth. In the stone business, flaming is a widely used process to improve the durability and aesthetic appeal of natural stone products. Using big propane torches or burners, a focused flame that may reach temperatures of up to 1,500 degrees Celsius or 2,732 degrees Fahrenheit is directed across the granite surface. This procedure gives the finished product more visual appeal by smoothing out blemishes. Granite slabs are cut for landscaping using a variety of methods that are tailored to the particular requirements of outdoor use. The three main types of cuts that are needed are split-faced, curved and straight. The most popular applications for straight cuts are in retaining walls, pavers, steps and other regular shapes. Multi-wire saws and gang saws, which are made especially for accurately and efficiently cutting granite, are used to make these cuts. However, in order to create patios, pool copings, or other rounded features in landscape design, curved cuts are required. Have you ever wondered how these bricks are made? Join us on a journey through the fascinating process as we showcase the craftsmanship and innovation behind this ancient building material. The process of making bricks begins with clay, a component of sedimentary rock commonly found on floodplains, riverbanks, or where bodies of water used to be. What makes clay special is that it becomes plastic and moldable when wet, but becomes hard and durable when fired. Another type of soil commonly used is loam, which is a mixture of clay, sand, and silt. Loam soils are prized for their balanced composition and are often found in agricultural areas. The collection of loam involves carefully selecting areas with the right balance of clay, sand and silt to ensure the quality of the bricks. Once the soil is collected, it is then transported to the brickyard for further processing. This marks the beginning of the journey from raw soil to the finished brick. After the soil is collected, it undergoes a refining process to remove impurities and large debris such as rocks and roots and ensure uniformity. This refining is typically done using special machinery that sifts through the soil, separating the big particles from the smaller ones. The screened soil is then transferred to a storage area, ready for the next stage of processing. Did you know the Great Wall of China one of the world's most iconic structures, utilized bricks extensively in its construction. Despite its immense size, stretching over 13,000 miles, the wall showcases the durability of brick construction, with many parts remaining intact centuries after their initial construction. Did you also know that up to 400,000 people died while building the Great Wall, many of whom were convicts? It is believed many are buried within the wall itself, Next, a key transformation occurs with the addition of calcstein and brantkalk to the soil. These substances alter the soil's composition, making it stick together better, which is important for making high-quality bricks. The soil goes through a process called weathering, which involves exposing it to the elements for some time. This natural process helps the soil break down gradually, making it easier to work with. Weathering helps to improve the plasticity of clay soils and ensures a more consistent texture throughout the process. Once the soil has been weathered enough, it is then mixed with water to create a slurry. This slurry undergoes another round of refinement, 
passing through screens and filters to eliminate any remaining impurities. The refined soil is now ready for the next stage of the brick-making process. The first step in this phase is forming, where the soil is shaped into brick moulds to create individual bricks. This can be done using either moulding or extrusion techniques, depending on the desired characteristics of the bricks. Once compacted, the excess soil is trimmed off, leaving behind neatly formed bricks. Moulding allows for flexibility in brick design and can accommodate various sizes and shapes. Alternatively, extrusion involves forcing the refined soil through a die or mould to create continuous lengths of brick-shaped material. The extruded material is then cut into individual bricks of uniform size and shape. Extrusion is a more efficient method for producing large quantities of bricks quickly and consistently. Regardless of the method used, forming is an important step in the brick-making process, as it determines the size, shape, and structural integrity of the bricks. After forming, the newly shaped bricks undergo a drying process to remove excess moisture and prepare them for firing. Proper drying is necessary to prevent cracking or distortion during the firing process and ensure the bricks strength and durability. Bricks are typically dried in controlled environments, such as drying chambers or tunnels, where temperature and humidity levels can be carefully regulated. This helps ensure uniform drying and prevents uneven moisture distribution within the bricks. The drying process may take several days to complete depending on factors such as brick size, thickness, and ambient conditions. The bricks gradually lose moisture during drying, causing them to shrink slightly. This shrinkage helps improve the bricks' density and strength, making them more resilient to thermal stress and mechanical forces. Once dried, the bricks are ready for firing, a process that involves subjecting them to high temperatures in kilns. Firing is a critical stage in the brick-making process as it imparts strength, durability and desirable properties to the bricks. Kilns are large, insulated chambers or furnaces designed to withstand high temperatures. Bricks are loaded into the kiln in carefully arranged stacks or layers, allowing for even heating and uniform firing. The firing process typically involves heating the bricks to temperatures ranging from 1000 to 2000 degrees Fahrenheit, 537 to 1093 degrees Celsius over several hours. During firing, several chemical and physical changes occur within the bricks. The heat causes the clay minerals in the bricks to undergo vitrification where they soften and fuse, forming a dense solid structure. Once the bricks have been fired and cooled in the kiln, they are then ready for the final making process. The first step in this phase is striking. Striking involves removing any excess material or imperfections from the bricks to ensure a smooth and uniform finish. This is typically done using specialized tools such as wire cutters or trimmers. Workers carefully inspect each brick, trimming off any rough edges or irregularities to enhance its appearance and functionality. Striking is essential because it ensures that the bricks will fit together neatly when used in construction, creating a strong and aesthetically pleasing finish. After striking, the bricks are sorted based on their quality and appearance. This is vital in ensuring that only the best bricks are used in construction projects. Once sorted, the bricks are stacked and prepared for transportation to construction sites. Proper stacking is important to prevent damage during transit and ensure that the bricks arrive at their destination in good condition. Bricks are typically stacked on pallets or in crates, with protective layers between each layer to prevent scratching or chipping. This careful handling helps preserve the integrity of the bricks and ensures that they are ready for immediate use upon arrival, 
at the construction site. Brick making involves several steps that need to be done to turn raw materials into good bricks for building. From soil collection and preparation to molding, drying, firing, inspection and distribution, every step requires careful planning, execution and quality control to ensure that the production is durable, reliable and aesthetically pleasing. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, please feel free to hit the notification bell and subscribe so you don't miss out on future episodes. Thanks for watching.